Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rates here on Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. While there's a lot of issues happening in our world, um, of course, we've we've been following mass exoduses from Abertron, uh to uh, Armenia. We've been following Central Africa and what is happening there and, of course, intense and continued fighting in uh, Sudan with people fleeing from Sudan to South Sudan and causing massive hunger issues. We've heard lots about Haiti o- over th- over the years now. With Haiti, with um, after a couple disasters hitting uh, that one island, and, and the funny part is is that you have the Dominican Republic the exists on the same exact island as Haiti their community is doing pretty okay and has recovered from earthquakes disasters and storms and things that have hit that little island because it's not a very big island Whereas Haiti has been stymied and stifled and stuck in some state of rebuilding. In Haiti, it was was a was a nice place, you know, a pretty, fairly, fairly decent uh, economy and things like that, you know. Um, happy people, very festive people, um, to now that where it, it's run by gangs and, and almost like a war, warlord sort of states and things like that. Um, and there's a lot of oppression happening in, in their, their stymied state of rebuilding. And trying to figure out who, what is going to, their government is going to look like because of collapses. And what does that look like for the United Nations and humanitarian efforts to get through and help Haiti? Um, Brazil has, of course, taken up the, the, the torch for Haiti. And they want to help, help them as best as best as as our world can actually help them with what is happening. Along with that, we're we're going to hear some other issues from from around the world in uh, in a, in a press briefing um, from the United Nations press floor. But we're also going to hear uh, from um, Sudan, where. There is a impending food crisis about to happen. It, uh, a massive hunger crisis because of people fleeing, fighting, and military actions that where they're fleeing to in South Sudan is coming up short for food. So we're going to hear from the World Food Program about what is happening from that. They have have a representative that's going to be there uh, um, via Zoom 
and she's going to tell us what's happening there and what may, what could be done to help the situation. Of course, in many cases, it does leave leave this question, and we'll say that, say this for final thoughts. How do you help a nation and a group of people where the government becomes the roadblock of oppression? All right. Uh, good afternoon. Um, in a short while, uh, we will be joined um, by Mary Ellen McCourty, who, as you know, is a World Food Program's country director for South Sudan. Um, and she will brief you as today the World Food Program is warned that a hunger emergency is looming on the border between South Sudan and Sudan. Families continue to cross the border towards South Sudan every day because of the fighting in Sudan. She will join us virtually from Juba. Um, and as I mentioned to you yesterday, Monica Grayley will not be briefing you through uh, the week. Um, and at 1.30 p.m. here, there'll be a briefing by Reem uh, Al Salam, the Special Rapporteur against vi on Violence Against Women and Girls, its Causes and Consequences, and she's here in New York uh, to brief the third committee. Um, update for you from our UN team in Armenia as they boost the support for the government's response to address the influx of refugees. More than 100,000 people have now crossed into Armenia, according to information received from the government. Uh, the UN Development Program started renovating space for elderly persons. For its part, the World Health Organization is also sending medicines uh, for, uh, to treat non-communicable uh, diseases, covering three months of treatment for up to 50,000 people. The UN Refugee Agency is providing uh, technical assistance to authorities for refugee registration, distributing court relief items, also conducting protection monitoring in government-run registration centers. Our team on the ground is also focusing on much-needed psychosocial support to refugees, including with uh, the UN Development Program, the World Health Organization. Uh, the acting resident coordinator, Natalia uh, Nachilvili, uh, stress that behind each number is a child, a woman, a man, an elderly person, a family who left everything behind, urgently needed support. She reiterated the UN's team determination to provide assistance. And, um, quick update from our peacekeeping colleagues in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, they tell us that a, the peace, UN peacekeepers on the ground have launched a joint operation with the Congolese Armed Forces against uh, the armed group known as Codeco. The operation is taking place in the Jugu territory in the province of Ituri and comes in response to recent attacks against civilians and the presence of Codeco members in the area, including most recently near the Lala camp for displaced persons, which is about nine kilometers southwest of Jugu, excuse me, southeast of Jugu. On that occasion, peacekeepers uh, were deployed. They fired warning shots as they observed Kodeko members approaching the site and, forced them, um, they, and forcing them to withdraw. Peacekeepers are continuing to patrol the area to protect civilians and deter armed groups, including physical protection for more than 100,000 men, women, and children who've been displaced through in four temporary bases in the Jugu territory. Uh, update for you from Syria and a bit of uh, good news, but also underscoring the uh, uh, dramatic health uh, situation. The Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says that the first radiotherapy machine to treat cancer arrived in the Northwest over the weekend. This comes on the heels of advocacy efforts led by the UN and our partners with the support of the government of Turkey. Uh, this is a monumental step for cancer treatment in northwest Syria. Radiotherapy sessions are not available in local health facilities. Syrian cancer patients have been dependent on cross-border referrals to Turkey, and the system was temporarily disrupted uh, earlier this year due to the earthquake. The machine, which can provide more than 40 radiotherapy sessions a day, is now in the largest hospital in Afrin. The hospital is making adjustments to meet the operational standards and safety requirements 
of a radiotherapy center. Once ready, the facility is expected to meet the needs of up to one-third of all cancer patients in northwest Syria. Turkish health authorities are also providing support for a year with Turkish technicians and oncologists operating the machine on site and also training Syrian health workers. And just to flag that we need more support to expand access to local cancer treatment services, including in Idlib governorate. Um, the, turning to Haiti, the Secretary General, of course, welcomes the adoption of yesterday's resolution, which, as you know, proved the deployment of a non-UN multinational security support mission. In a statement issued after the vote, the head of the political mission in the country, Maria Isabel Salvador, says this is a positive and decisive step to bring peace and stability to Haiti. The decision, she added, comes after a request by the Haitian government and echoed by the Secretary General, realizing that the country will not emerge from the current security situation without strong international support from the Haitian National Police. Yesterday's resolution did not approve a UN mission, but the integrated uh, office, um, sorry, yesterday's resolution was not about the approval of a UN mission, uh, but the UN integrated office in Haiti said it will fully support the multinational security support mission within the limits of its own mandate, of course, the human rights due diligence policy and in full respect of the decisions taken by the Haitian state. While awaiting the deployment of the mission, the UN will continue to engage closely with Haitian authorities, in particular in support of the police, the corrections and justice system, and the electoral process. Uh, and just for the record, I do want to note that yesterday we issued a statement on behalf of the Secretary General condemning uh, the attacks, uh, terrorist attacks that had taken place in Ankara the day before. Benno. Thank you, Steph. Um, a couple on Haiti. Um, first of all, um, how many police forces um, are, or, uh, did, how, how many uh, police forces have been pledged already? I think Kenya was about like uh, 1,000, but it's still pretty far away from the 2,000 you guys are aiming for, right? Yeah, I don't have the, the total numbers. As uh, uh, we know, a number of countries have indicated support. The resolution calls on countries that are interested to notify the Secretary General. Right now, as far as we know, is it, I mean, the, the Kenya is the only country officially mentioned, but obviously we will wait for others to, to pledge. Okay, and a few more. I know that you don't really like to talk about time horizons, but are we, like, to this, till the start th of this mission, are we talking about, like, month or weeks? Will it happen this year? What, what do you expect, at least? Well, you know, the, I mean, again, if you look at the resolution, it calls on um, the members of the, of the force um, and the countries leading it to come up with a concept plan and to work with the Haitian authorities. So that's a question that should be asked right now of the, the Kenyans. Okay, and the last one. And more a meta uh, question about the functionality of the Security Council. You yesterday said this was exactly what the SG said one year ago. Yeah. This is exactly what he wanted. Now um, the Security Council approved the mission, giving given all the dysfunctionality in the in the in the council. Ukraine cross border uh, DPRK. Um, what's your assessment um, regarding uh, what what this decision means? Is it like a glimpse of hope, or like how do you see it? I take it as a positive development uh, that answers the call, most importantly, of the Haitians themselves and of the Secretary General to help um, to help the people of Haiti. Uh, I, I'm not in the business of extrapolating um, and see what what is the greater impact on this on uh, on the on the universe. I think I will leave it to uh, journalists and analysts such as yourselves. Uh, Amelie, then Deji, then Stefano. Thanks, Steph. A follow-up on Haiti. Uh, several um, Security Council member ambassador yesterday talked about a uh, learning lesson from the past in Haiti. Um, what do you think, what the Secretary thinks is needed to avoid that this, mi this mission ends up with leaving Haiti back to square one, where it is today, which happened every time after there was a, an international mission sent there? It's about keeping the long-term goals uh, in mind and understanding that 
sometimes decisions uh, made in the in the moment uh, will only increase uh, the cost and, and and the suffering and to the international community needs to stand by the people of the Haiti for the long term it's a long game Deji so a couple of questions but first to follow up also on Haiti um, after the resolution because we know that Kenya is sending about 1,000. What, 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 is, what is the Secretary General's expectation? How, how fast could this, be this multinational uh, force can be assembled to, to dispatch there? Well, first of all, you know, obviously, the, the faster, the, the, the better. I mean, not the things should not, I mean, but, th th but things need to be done in a, in a way where the force, once deployed, uh, can function. I mean, it, it needs to be done in a methodical way uh, as quickly as possible. But the onus should not only be on, on, on Kenya uh, and those uh, who may step up more officially. It needs to be on the international community as a whole, on the Security Council. They, the mission will need financial, uh, financial support. Um, so it is not... Um, let, let's not put everything on the shoulders of the Kenyans uh, but, at this point. The, the, the international community will need to help in whatever way they can. But the thing is, as I, as I understand, even the parliament of Kenya didn't approve of the, this I, idea. I, I right? can't speak to the internal or constitutional workings of the Kenyan government. Okay, now, now my question. What it's, was that before? It, that's the follow-up. Oh, is this a follow-up? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so <laughs> it's, it's been quite... It's, it's been quite a while that we didn't ask about the, the, the latest update on the Black Sea Initiative. Okay. Uh, that, that's the question. Uh, is there any update on okay. the okay. Black okay. Sea okay. Initiative? No, I, as Stefano knows, I like to hear a question mark at the end of a sentence. So, <laughs> uh, um, the, the only update to, to share with you is that the Secretary General continues to be determined uh, to get as much uh, of the, the Ukrainian grain and Russian grain fertilizer out to, to market, and uh, his efforts and his, uh, the efforts of his team continue in that regard. The, the other day, uh, the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov here said he was surprised that the Secretary General was still trying to fulfill the the memorandum uh, and the MOU I, with Russia I don't I don't think anybody should be surprised by the determination the determination of Antonio Guterres uh, one last question sorry uh, on Monday on Monday uh, early morning the Israeli army carried a airstrike in Syria in Del Sur which is quite different because normally they would have the airstrike on the western part of Syria but now they went to deeper into the eastern part does the Secretary General think this is this might be a escalation in that region because we know that the Syrian Syrian issue is quite sensitive there? Look, I mean, we have spoken out regularly and will continue to uh, uh, against the the airstrikes that we're seeing in uh, in Syria, the violence that we're seeing in in Syria, and I think all of this is a reminder of the need for a political solution and for people to rally around the work of Gare Pedersen. Stefano. Thank you, Stefan. One is, I guess, a follow-up, uh, and one, and then I have another question. Uh, on Haiti, um, who, how did, can you tell us how uh, Kenya was actually <coughs> the country that was, I understand that Kenya offered uh, to, to be the, the leading country, but uh, because uh, Kenya has a history with its police, and if we just Google, Kenya police violence, you find everything even just few months ago. How Kenya was picked to be well, the Kenya, country Kenya, to provide? First of all, two, two, two points to make, three points. Uh, one, there are few countries in the world that have not had at one point or another issues with police violence, right? I mean, and we see it north, south, east, and west. Um, what is important? And it's stated in the resolution that uh, all uh, police and others that are deployed uh, respect uh, the human rights policies and, and go through the, we will support uh, those countries with the human rights due diligence uh, policy. Secretary General did not choose Kenya. The Secretary General and the Haitian government put out an appeal 
and Kenya step forward, and I assume, and uh, we've seen reports and press reports of others stepping forward. Yes, but uh, the, the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador, was asked yesterday, um, "Who is responsible if the Kenyan forces abuse their for their, their their mandate and they start to have uh, commit crime?" And is the U.S. responsible that he's, for example, putting the money? And she answered, no. Look, the, is the, Kenya the, is I, responsible. I was asked uh, yesterday, and I'll kind of repeat maybe a little bit more, uh, a bit more detail. Um, it is important uh, that everything be done to prevent any sort of abuse by any troops and police that are... Uh, that, that are deployed. Uh, we've advocated, and the Secretary General in his proposal advocated for a strong and robust prevention response system to put safeguards in place uh, on that. Again, read the resolution. The resolution is fairly explicit and says that member states participating uh, in this force take necessary measure to ensure appropriate conduct and discipline and to prevent sexual exploitation and abuse. All, we call on all member states to implement uh, that framework. It is incumbent on any member state, any member, to ensure that there's a robust oversight mechanism to prevent uh, such incidents should they, and if they occur, to deal with them clearly. Uh, you know, ultimately, as it is with, with, with peacekeepers uh, who commit abuses, member states have the ultimate authority and responsibility for the people they send abroad. I was in this room actually with uh, with uh, the f the former secretary general, also this secretary general, when there were conversation about that this system had to be changed because the abuse that the that the blue helmet had in the past that was the problem. Then then there was the. the I mean, we can. I mean, Stefano, we can have a much uh, longer conversation no, no, about okay. how the system. You know, but this is uh, no uh, uh, how the system that we've put into place right now in terms of UN peacekeepers and UN staff is much more, uh, I think, more effective, more victim-centered, and much more transparent. Has, have we been able to eradicate uh, every incident of a human being abusing another human being? Sadly not, right? But I think in terms of responsibilities and where they lie, it's pretty clear. Uh, Michelle. And, and I had the question, this, um, and between, uh, I asked you uh, a few days ago, you said that you didn't have any answer, but uh, maybe now you have. It's about the, the migrant situation in the Mediterranean and the and, um, agreement, uh, memorandum between Europe and uh, Tunisia. Uh, now there are problems, Tunisia is saying like that they are not in the business of protecting uh, some other countries' uh, um, borders. So does the Secretary General have any opinion about if this agreement is uh, legitimate, is something that It's not for him to, uh, to endorse, uh, condone, or otherwise this, uh, this discussion between the EU and, uh, and Tunisia, where the Secretary General wants, and I, forgive me if I've said this about 1,230 times, is for members, for countries of destination, countries of transit, like Tunisia, and they're, they're not the only one, and countries of origin actually come together and implement the frameworks that are already in place under the migration agreement. Michelle Van Evelyn. Uh, apologies if someone's already asked this. I was a little late coming in. On Haiti, the resolution also requires countries participating to notify the SG of their participation. I know we're less than 24 hours in, but have you received? No, as uh, we've just we checked in anticipation of such a question, which Benno kind of asked, uh, and Amelie and Deji. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we've not. <laughs> nothing. Uh, Evelyn. Yes, uh, there, you put out a statement yesterday on Azerbaijan. That, that was so favorable, you would think that uh, the uh, Armenians were being put out and put up in four-star hotels. Meanwhile, they've been chased out of their homes, and there are all sorts of UN agencies helping them. Uh, is there any reason that 
the UN put out a statement it, that it, it wasn't it, it wasn't it, it wasn't a it wasn't an opinion statement it was an it was a statement of what they saw right of what they saw with their own eyes and what they and it, it talked about what they saw and what they didn't see uh, we know very well we have been dealing with now uh, in supporting the government of Armenia with the hundred thousand or so men women and children who've arrived in Armenia clearly under trauma right or being treated as refugees according to refugee law according to what UNHCR uh, tells us our colleagues can only report on what they saw people can analyze and you know extrapolate that's your 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 role and your freedom as a journalist but they reported on what they saw well they didn't see executions because there were well I'm just is that but yeah. what's the question yeah no, never mind okay thank you yes sir um, I have one question about uh, Black Sea Initiative. All three ports uh, on the Black Sea are back in operation. Mm -hmm. Ukraine uh, was able to organize this uh, process in on its own, uh, without Russia, without Turkey, and without uh, United Nations. Ships with grain are on their way. Uh, I mean, uh, first 10 ships. So is the Black Sea Initiative a thing of past, or it has some future? Thank you. I mean, we're, you know, we're not involved in uh, in monitoring the ships that are uh, going out through the Black Sea. The fact that there is grain going out is is a good uh, is good news for uh, for all those involved, notably for the global food market. We continue to believe that a, a resume Black Sea grain uh, Black Sea initiative, along with the MOU, would increase the volume in a much more uh, stable. Uh, in a stable, stable manner and safer manner. Madame, and then we'll go to Margaret Bashir, who's been very patient, I think. Uh, thanks, Steph. I thought it was a good idea to, uh, you know, we had the Chagossian people coming just in uh, our uh, journalist association to give us uh, a little uh, update on how the situation is between this um, decision of the GA in 2019 to place at to give actually uh, of the CIG, sorry, in 2019, to give the GA the power to represent the Chagossian people' interest uh, here at the UN. This is a GA thing, but for the Secretariat, would the Secretary General be ready to meet the representant of the Chagossian people uh, to try to make a move in this? On I, I'm not aware that uh, any request to meet uh, has been uh, has been received. Uh, Margaret Bashir, Voice of America. Oh, thank you, Steph. Um, Steph, the, uh, there's a lengthy piece today out by reporters at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project uh, that zeroes in on alleged uh, corruption, bribery at the United Nations uh, that went on over several years. And uh, I know you're quoted in the article, but if you could give us some reaction uh, to it, and uh, just tell us maybe when did the UN become aware of Carrie Ann and Gina Zhu's activities at the UN? And have you raised this at all, for instance, with the Chinese mission or the Marshall Islands mission? Uh, we, d we did become aware of their activities uh, by way of an internal investigation that was ongoing uh, regarding a, a staff member. Um, I think the the the, the, the story and the, the underscores uh, the need for all those who have access uh, to, to this building uh, to understand that it is uh, something to be protected uh, and not to be sold in, in any manner. Uh, now, obviously, this involves a very small number of, uh, of, uh, of people. Um, and I can also tell you that we have been, uh, as we, uh, it is, as it is our responsibility, cooperating with uh, local law enforcement. So, was the uh, the investigation you're referring to of a staff member was that John Victor and Colo? I'll refer you to. I, I won't say any more at this uh, at this point. Just a little follow up to uh, Stefano about migration in the EU. Obviously, you know that the EU is working on a reform of their migration system. Are you guys observing this, and do you have any opinion about uh, the proposals? I, 
I have no doubt that people who are involved with issues of migration as refugees are observing it. Uh, and I would refer you, I think, for a more informative answer to UNHCR and uh, IOM. Uh, on that note, uh, I'd like to make sure Mary Ellen is connected from uh, Juba. Um, good evening, good day to, to, to everyone in the room and, and, and online. So, and thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you from Juba today and just put a little bit of a spotlight on the situation for, for people fleeing war in Sudan. Um, the humanitarian situation at the Sudan, South Sudan border is at a critical juncture and we really do fear a hunger emergency is looming if humanitarian agencies are unable to scale up the responses as needed. People crossing the border are arriving with harrowing stories of escape as they've made their way to South Sudan. Robberies, sexual violence, and long journeys on foot with no food or water. By the time these families arrive in South Sudan, their resources have been completely depleted and they are already well on the way to a hunger emergency. The recent data collected by our civil WFP shows that 90% of families have gone multiple days without eating and are experiencing moderate to severe food insecurity on arrival. One in five children and more than one quarter of all mothers who have been screened at the border are malnourished. Almost 300,000 people have crossed so far from Sudan into South Sudan since the conflict started more than five months ago and upwards of 1,000 people continue to arrive each day. The families that we see crossing today are even more vulnerable and food insecure than those that arrived in the early weeks of the conflict, and it's getting worse. Over 90% of the people arriving are South Sudanese, arriving at the border crossing points with a desire to move further onwards to, to family and home sets further inside South Sudan. Onward transportation is difficult. The only viable modes are river that is sparked with climate and extensive air solutions. Joda Rank is the main crossing point, and Rank is over 1,600 kilometers from Juba. Access is challenging in the best of times, but most particularly in the rainy season, making the response much more complex. An already difficult humanitarian situation is exacerbated by the ongoing rainy season. Because of the heavy rains, flooding has wiped out roads and created severely waterlogged conditions twice in the past few weeks. And the local communities or host communities are not immune to this. They have been severely impacted by this flooding with over 4,000 of them displaced. The mud and stagnant water in the makeshift camps where people stay while awaiting onward transportation is a perfect breeding, breeding ground for disease, which is contributing further to hunger and malnutrition, especially amongst the youngest children who are the most vulnerable. Currently, there are around 12,000 people in the transit centre waiting for onward transport with new arrivals every day and over 3,000 people at Palooch waiting also for transport and are in dire need of support. WFP is supporting the newly arrived families with everything we have available, hot meals, high energy biscuits, dry rations, and cash-based transfers. We are screening young children and mothers for malnutrition and providing treatment or preventative support as required. But all this is only meeting the most immediate needs of these families, and the rations we are able to provide are 50% of what they should be. Many of the returnees have lived in urban areas of Sudan for years, decades, or even generations. The areas they are returning to in South Sudan are unfamiliar and largely rural, agricultural-based communities. Coming from urban environments, many of the families do not have the skills needed to build livelihoods for themselves, and, and they have missed the growing season for this year. And this means not only do they need food today, but they also require longer-term support as they try to rebuild their lives. Before the war in Sudan, and the tragedy that has caused the situation in South Sudan was already desperate, with sadly over 7.4 million people estimated to be food insecure. 
many of the communities people are returning to are also facing humanitarian crises of their own, driven by the conflict, the climate crisis, and soaring food prices. So far, we have registered over 220,000 returnees in arriving some, in some of the most food insecure zones of the country. They are fleeing the dangers of war to a situation of absolute despair. WFP is struggling to address the immediate needs of the returnees, let alone help them to build a sustainable future. This year, WFP received less than half the funding that we needed, and the outlook for next year is looking equally concerning. Simply put, half the funding translates into half the food assistance. In order to reach as many people as possible, WFP slashed rations to 50%, meaning people receive less than 300 grams of food per day. And this includes the people arriving from Sudan. Continuing in this manner means that we will be unable to break the cycle of entrenched hunger in South Sudan and provide a way out for the families facing extreme hunger. We are barely pulling people back from the cliff edge of desperation. And while we do not expect the funding outlook for 2024 to drastically improve, we implore the global community to remember that just barely saving lives is not enough. We need durable solutions that will assist the returnees to South Sudan and the South Sudanese in the deepest trenches of food insecurity to build their own livelihoods and live a dignified life free of this persistent hunger. This will mean supporting communities to adapt farming practices and introduce climate smart agriculture, investing in peace building programs and improving infrastructure so communities can withstand and provoke hope with the numerous shots. WFP has seen the successes that are possible in South Sudan when people are given opportunities and the tools needed to succeed. Despite the growing humanitarian crisis at the border with Sudan, if these families can be supported to resettle in their communities and rebuild their broken livelihoods, then all hope is not lost. We need to bring this hope and possibility to the many children and the thousands of families who are fleeing the war in Sudan and making an arduous journey to safety. They deserve and require our support. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Ellen McGrorty, the WFP's country director in South Sudan. If anybody has a question, please, Evelyn, go. Evelyn. Uh, I can see you, but I can't see our guest. Well, we were anyway, having technical difficulties, and please keep the mic. Um, but anyway, welcome. On behalf of the UN Correspondent Association, my name is Evelyn Le Leopold. Um, the, uh, what, what the, you talked about onward transportation to where is one question, and the second is, Many years ago, I, I did visit Juba, and uh, I wonder, is the government functioning at all there now? Does it have any role? Mary Ellen? Thank you. Yep. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, the, um, the, the owner transportation, yes, said over 90% over of the people that are coming are actually South Sudanese uh, citizens, returnees. Uh, many of them are, are looking for onward transportation to the original, the original place of, of, of family, origin, homestead. Uh, many of what we're seeing coming at the moment are going into the Upper Nile, Unity State, uh, Wales. So I mean, it's right, it's right across the country where where, where they are returning to. Because many of them, I mean, there's quite a large population of South Sudanese in, in Sudan. Um, in Juba, the, the government, you know, we constantly call on the, on the government to 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 step up. Uh, on the humanitarian assistance side. Uh, we do have to, of course, um, commend the, the huge welcome that is given to the people that are returning from Sudan, and it's not only returnees, but also refugees. Um, but yes, definitely uh, much, much more needs to be done on their side in terms of working with, with the transport and supporting with the humanitarian effort. Over. Sorry, I... Your mic, yeah. Would they have where would the onward transport go <clears throat> back to Sudan or to which country? Yeah, the onward transport would mean, mean coming in. They're coming in up the, up the very north of, of South Sudan, a place called Rank. So it's basically onward transport to places like Malakal, to places like Bentu, places like Wau, and places like Bahar Ghazan, and even some looking, looking to come as far as Juba. 
Thank you, Mary Ellen. Is there any other question? Or anybody online? So, okay. With this, uh, I thank you so much, Mary Ellen McGrorty, the World Food Program's Country Director in South Sudan. Thank you for your time. Final thoughts. I asked the question, how do you, do you help um, a country and a group and a, and a people that has a roadblock that is the gov oppressive government? While we don't really have the answer to that because they are the governing body and if they decide to oppress their people, they're, that's the first roadblock into helping people. And changing how the government actually does things. Not an easy task. And it isn't, um, it, it doesn't come with, with a whole lot of, of answers either. So while I really can't ha answer this question, and I don't, haven't found the person who could possibly answer that question. The only thing we we can do is try to find small and intermittent ways to get around that government to help as many people as possible for as long as it takes to actually get real humanitarian efforts to help people so that no one has to remain impoverished and everyone in our world so that we can make this a human right to have plenty of food and a safe home to live in. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to Policy and Rights here in Depictions Media Radio. Please find that subscribe button wherever it may be so we can all create that loving world that we really want. show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.